Ever heard of the Cibola National Forest? Neither had we. This is definitely something worth your time. 1.9 million acres of land spanning Texas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. After a hearty breakfast of bacon, eggs, and hash browns, we finally got on the road to Mount Taylor. We had picked Tristan up the night before at the Albuquerque airport, with his sister Taylor arriving later that evening. Yeah, sure, Taylor was supposed to have gotten there early enough to pick her big brother up from the airport, but she'd gotten a late start from her army base in Arizona and took a couple of unintended off-road detours on the way. Our destination today was the 11,305-foot dormant stratovolcano known as Mount Taylor. And in case you're curious about that last member of our party, this is Riley. You know, that looked like you were almost flipping them off. Why would you almost. flip your children off? What does that mean? I don't know hang loose, because hang loose is this, isn't it? So I don't what even know it? what I'm telling you. <laughs> Mount Taylor was located approximately 11 miles from where we camped at the National Forest Coal Mine Camp. After leaving the paved road on Route 547, you eventually get onto the La Mosca Lookout Road, which is generally dirt and can be rough and rocky. Onyx rates this trail at a non-technical 2. This trail proved to be a very easy trail where we didn't really need our four-wheel drive or high clearance, at least for the first several miles. This trail also boasts some vast and scenic views, which is probably part of the reason we never actually made it to Mount Taylor. You see that tower right there? We've been seeing that all morning. We assumed that that was on the top of Mount Taylor. It was so enticing we drove right past the turn to go up Mount Taylor and instead found ourselves driving up this steep and rocky stretch towards the Lamasco Lookout. Remember how I said you probably didn't really need four-wheel drive for this road? Well, once we reached this section, that's where we started to change our mind. The fire lookout on Lamasca Peak was built in 1939 and was replaced again during the 1960s. The lookout on the Mosca Peak actually replaced a fire tower that previously operated from Mount Taylor. The fire tower on Mount Taylor stood several hundred feet higher than this one on La Mosca. The Forest Service built this additional lookout at La Mosca because this particular lookout boasts much clearer views. Our entire goal for that day was to reach the top of Mount Taylor. Well, we hadn't exactly done that, but we didn't really want to drive back down the same road to drive up Mount Taylor. And at this point, it wasn't even close to lunchtime yet, so we had to find a new goal and a new place to explore. It was at that point that we all suddenly realized that there was a road going in a direction we didn't anticipate. Another road going away from civilization and deeper into the wilderness. And we knew that was the road for us. This is the La Mosca Peak Road, also known as Forest Service Road 453. This road is clearly marked both on Gaia GPS and Onyx, but nobody really gave you a good description of this particular road. This trail was not technical, although it was definitely rough and rocky. The trail had beautiful scenery, including drives through aspen-laden forests, 
and views across the meadows into the mountains. After enjoying the La Mosca Peak Road, we turned off onto the Spud Patch Road, also known as Forest Service Road 451. It was here that we found a perfect place to stop and enjoy lunch. Bill also pointed out the rock formations that were nearby, and I climbed energetically up those formations into the rocks to see what I could see. When I was in my teens and 20s, I used to love going out and doing some rock climbing. Sure, I wasn't the multi-pitch rock climbing variety because I'm a little afraid of heights, but I really do miss that. I haven't fit in that climbing harness for probably two decades at this point, but I do still really enjoy a little bouldering when I find it. friend. Are you going to drive the second half of today? Hi there, bud. What you doing? That just doesn't look comfortable. Oop, there went. The roads we'd driven that day really hadn't presented much of a technical challenge. So everybody was a little excited when Forest Route 451 Threw at least a little bit of challenge our way. Forest Service Road 451 eventually turned into a much wider, smoother, easy-going road. As our navigator that day, I'd noticed a binocular icon on Gaia GPS. Forest Service Road 451 slowed us down so much I thought we wouldn't make it. But when we reached this road, and we could go much more quickly, I knew it was worth giving it a chance. Welcome to Forest Service Road 239Q. Gaia GPS told me not only could there be a view out past this road, but there was also likely to be a gate. But we took the risk anyway. And when we got there, we found that there was a gate. But it's one of those great western gates that you're more than welcome to get out and open as long as you make sure to close it behind you. Forest Road 239Q eventually turned into 239S, or, or maybe it was 239WB, or, well, eventually we found our way to Forest Road 239J. Areas like this are definitely worth exploring. Just make sure you have your maps downloaded in advance. These areas rarely have enough cell service to maintain undownloaded maps. 
Also keep in mind that the maps may not accurately reflect the path of today's trails. In this instance, our persistence in reaching that binocular icon along Road 239J was well rewarded. Even Rue decided to get out of the Jeep this time so she could come and enjoy that beautiful view. In case you're curious, Rue had been with us the entire trip, but today she was in the Jeep pouting most of the day, probably because she finds Riley's energy a little too exuberant. change in music can make even a cow seem creepy? I mean, come on, it's a cow. How creepy can they be? Leaving the viewpoint behind, we drove back out of that area on 239, well, I think it was 239, Jay. But at this point, something was starting to bother us. And it wasn't the narrowness of this track, though that was surprising to us. wasn't that those clouds looked like maybe they could threaten rain, though the kind of surface on this road would turn to slick, wet, nasty mud if it were wet. And it wasn't the eerie silence that hung over this track. Instead, it was something that had been nagging at Bill for the entire trip. It was something about that Jeep the one he attended so carefully, maintained, reviewed, and prepared for this trip. It was something to do with that back brake, the one that went so spongy when we got to the campground, we almost didn't stop. So what you doing down here, Bill? You got a little something stuck in our caliper. Ooh. Just a little something, something. Mm -hmm. I can't see it from here, can I? You can't tell what in the world it is. Well, that's fun. I don't know if it's a rock. So what exactly brought this to your attention? Well, the brakes got a little hot and spongy. Uh-huh. Did you think you were going to stop? Well, it moves. It moves? Yeah, that means I can get it out, hopefully. Good. It could be just a sliver of sandstone. I can't tell what the heck it is. Pretty crazy. of uh, base camping, isn't it? There it is. Wow. Show it to the camera, please. Oh, that's massive. That's, that's not good. You know why? Why? That doesn't seem like it's a snow. That's it's part of the part of the brake pad. Oh, my gosh. Want to go to town? I, Are you having guess, issues? I guess we used them a bit coming out here without trailer brakes on some big downhills. So it probably okay. got hot and cracked the pad and it just came apart, right? And what else would it be? Because this is a fairly new caliper. The rest of them are originals. He does have to figure it out. That's just so the way I. he does this. So do I. Well, I don't feel like I'm fixing it if I don't really think I know what happens. You know what no, I mean? if you if you don't ad identify the cause, it's just going to happen again. Right. I'm still okay. Do so you think it was the end? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, that, you're right. There's nothing left. All, the, all that was left is that little piece that had slid out. See, it's gone. Yeah, and there's the back there. Poop sakes. That's why the pedal went douche. Douche. <laughs> Is that exactly what it did? Yeah, did, did it make that noise? Well, let's go get some pads because I don't think we need anything else, do we? I thought he was going to say let's go get pizza. Oh, let's do that too. <laughs> you could do that too. <laughs>
<laughs> you could do that too. So here's the current situation. The poor Jeep Rubicon is having some issues with brakes. Just very, very ironic. Bill had very cheekily put these stickers on right after Taylor got her Bronco. But today, it was the Bronco that was going to rescue the Rubicon. Probably should have changed them before I left. But I thought, hell, it'll be fine. Yeah, 1,700 miles later, not so much. Huh? Since we started overlanding, Bill has had to do several repairs like this in, well, less than ideal places with limited tools available. Thankfully, Bill has expansive knowledge on vehicles, what makes them operate, how they work, and how to put them back together in situations like this. Several thousand miles later, Bill actually did find out what had happened to this particular brake. In this instance, it had nothing to do with this brake. It had to do with the brake on the opposite side. Bill explained after we got home that he found out that the slide pins on the caliper on that driver's side were literally frozen in place, not allowing the caliper to do what it needed to, which meant that, well, the driver's side brake really wasn't braking at all. And likely this passenger side back brake was doing all the no, work for that back so axle. You order a cheap Chinese jack, you get a cheap Chinese jack. If you ever have to yes, do repairs did. like this in the field, make sure you stay flexible and try to have a good attitude. In this particular case, we were discovering that that cheap Chinese bottle jack that we had purchased, well, it was slowly leaking and the Jeep was slowly lowering, which caused this problem right here, which meant that yep. Bill had to raise that jack back up again to get the tire back on. Bill had also encountered another difficulty that afternoon. When he went into town to buy that brake pad so that we could replace it, he also bought a tool that compresses the caliper piston. After he left the store, he discovered that it was missing a part. He had to take it back, and he found a clamp that worked just as well. This brake pad failed because of all no, the additional stress. Chips Keep in mind, we weren't just patty. driving the Jeep up and down mountain roads. We were hauling a trailer up and down many of those mountain roads. Like Thankfully, that. this particular Chris repair did system. last us throughout the rest of our trip and got us home safely. Every trip we take, we seem to learn at least one thing new. There. In this particular instance, I'm pretty sure this is one more thing Bill is going to have on his checklist before we leave for our next adventure. That evening after dinner, Bill and I took a short walk near the campground and enjoyed the evening light. We also talked about where we might head tomorrow. Maybe someplace exactly like this. <laughs>